Okay, I think we are rolling. I wanted to give you a little video to try to help you a little bit more with how to draw a flowchart. Um, now, in general, flowcharts in biology are used to help us identify um, groups of organisms. So we'll get to that in a second. First, I want to go over the basic structure of it using a kind of silly example um, uh, to show you. Another one of these is at the end of your appendix, um, which you can find at the bottom of the middle page, or if you're in person, at the end of the workbook. So let's say we want to draw a flowchart that helps us identify a few types of eating utensils. So let's say we have a fork, a spoon, and a knife. Well, that's not going to be so complicated, is it? Well, maybe we want to add a couple more dishes too then? Yeah, let's do like a, also a plate and a bowl. All right, not that you need to take a biology class to know how to identify those things, but, you know, let's use it as a way for you to learn how to draw a flow chart before you even tackle the characteristics of microorganisms. So, the game here is that you draw a series of levels in your flow chart. So, each level, going from the top of the board to the bottom, is going to separate this group into two groups. And when you create your own flow chart, you get to be really creative in how you do that. There's a lot of characteristics to choose from that your brain uses to identify each of those things. Um, and you can choose um, how many of these you want in that group compared to that group. So how many I got? Five? So you could have one here and four there. Or you could have, I'm no mathematician, like two there and three there. Um, so let me just pick for you. I can give you a second to think about what you could do, though. Fast forward a couple seconds if you're already ready. Okay. Well, what if we say um, one of the one group is going to be the ones that hold liquid, and the other group could just be doesn't hold liquid. So here are the rules you can check each time you pick your sets of characteristics. One, it has to be distinguishing characteristics, meaning that one group will be able to be distinguished cleanly from the other. You can't be tempted to put a fork in both places, otherwise that wouldn't work. Um, you also need to have these two characteristics cover the whole group. You don't want to be able to write four of these on this level and then one just gets abandoned. So they have to be distinguishing characteristics. They have to be observable characteristics. So you can't just put a fork and spoon here or eating utensil here and then a plate and bowl here. You need to tell your reader how they're going to identify this group versus that group. We'll get back to that when we get to the biology. It's going to include stuff you can see under the microscope or tests you can do in the laboratory. You're going to get a lot of that over the next uh, month or two. Um, okay, but for now, let's go with this doesn't hold liquid. Which ones don't hold liquid? Go ahead and write it out with me. I really want to write this slowly on the board so that as you watch these videos, you can do some, you know, lecture notes. So go ahead and do this exercise with me, please. Um, or with me. This is a recording, isn't it? <laughs> doesn't hold liquid. So which ones don't hold liquid? Uh, I guess the fork doesn't. Um, the knife doesn't. The plate doesn't. Now, when you list this group, this can be like scratch work that you can erase later. I'll show you what I mean at the end. Um, when By the time we finish branching this all the way out, you're going to have just one of these at a time. But for now, we can just leave the group names that we have here on this side. Fork, knife, plate. So which ones do hold liquid? I guess the uh, bowl and the spoon. Okay, so next we keep going until we have branched this out to only have a box at each spot that has just one name in it. I'll show you what I mean. 
So how can we separate the bowl from the spoon? You're going to need another pair of characteristics. You got anything? Um, let me see. Think about it for a second. Put whatever you want. You don't have to put the same thing I'm going to put. Okay, so then we're going to have to separate these into two different groups. Okay, so how about um, uh, one of these is uh, one bite at a time? So we're going for size there, aren't we? Okay, one meal size or serving size, I guess. So size is going to be one we use in biology too, isn't it? So now we've separated these. We're done, spoon. Uh, bowl. You can be repetitive with, with which sets of characteristics you use on each side. Now importantly, uh, when you look at the spoon and backtrack, both of these characteristics are true. It's one bite size and holds liquid. Okay. So on this side, if you say the same thing, uh, one bite size, uh, um, also it's true that it doesn't hold liquid. All right, so I'm going to pause the video for a second, and then uh, you can see what you come up with to complete this, and I'll show you what I got, too. Okay, I wonder if the pause worked. I guess so. Okay, well, this is what I got. Um, could have gone with the same pair of characteristics over here, but I picked a different one. Again, a bunch of possible solutions here. Um, so the one that's not pointy, that's just my plate. So that one's already on its own, done. So it has a path that has characteristics that will lead you to the plate from the set of dishes. Um, we could title this flowchart, you know, dishes or dish types. Um, what about the pointy ones? Looks like we still have a set of two, fork, a knife. Okay, so you need another pair of, pair of characteristics. It's tempting to just write fork here and knife here. Not correct, because you have to show your field biologists or your microbiologist in the lab what they're looking for to be able to identify which one's the knife. So you could go with number of points. One point. Because I said it's pointy up here. Uh, now, I can't just say two points or three points because different forks have different number of points, right? Remember, each characteristic uh, combined with the other characteristics has to cover all possibilities. Can't leave any fork out. Um, to then differentiate between the different kinds of forks, your flow chart gets bigger. Um, am I still on the screen? I am. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, you could say, well, what could you say? Think about it. How about greater than one point? Now we've got forks. And a knife over here. Okay, now remember I said you can have a different style of drawing your flow chart that would still be correct. If I were to just erase um, this bit up here, and I just draw in a line that went straight through, this is still correct. It's just a different style. It might be harder to construct at first, and if you want it to end up like this, you can do some scratch work and erase it or have scratch paper or something. So now notice this still has all the same information. If I want to know what's on this side, I just look at the, look to the bottom. Looks like a fork, knife, and plate are the ones that don't hold liquid. Um, similarly, over here, you can try this like that. OK, so now I want to go on to some biology. And this is a chance to review some of the characteristics uh, for different groups of microorganisms that is at the start of your lab assignment under discussion questions for unit one. So there's a table there that allows you to work on some characteristics. Um, and it's also a chance for you to review some general biology again and pull it in and keep, remember, you, there's no shame in forgetting some stuff you got in Gen Bio. It just takes some practice to get all that back into your memory and at your fingertips and then the skill of applying it and stuff. Okay, so I want to do an example flowchart that uses the groups as they are listed 
at the top of the table in discussion question number one. Um, bacteria, archaea, fungi, protozoa, algae, helmets, viruses, and prions. Now, I want to warn you that there is a flow chart at the end of your assignment. And this example, I would suggest you have it in your notes as a way of practice and learning. But your flow chart in number 12 is going to look different because for that flow chart, you have to include the list shown there as written. So you're going to just push what I'm doing here just a little bit further for your assignment. For now, let me please go ahead and write um, this list with me. So we're going to try to differentiate between these groups of microorganisms. Fungi, that's a whole kingdom. Protozoans, okay, what else do we got on that list? Remember, it's a lot less boring if you're, if you're doing this with me, sorry to say. So it can't hurt to have some repetition, so just do this with me, okay? With me. Um, moments. I'm bound to have some spelling mistakes when I write and talk at the same time, I guess. Uh, viruses and prions. Okay, did I get them all? It looks like we've got eight on the list. Right. Okay. So think for a second what's one pair of possible characteristics that would cleanly split this into two different groups? There are so many ways to do this. I think the easiest way I find, and I see this in all the answers on number 12 too, is uh, separate these two out first. Remember in your Gen Bio review assignment, the two-minute questions assignment, you make, made an argument for why those two aren't living. Well, think back to what you said there. Invo one way to do it is to invoke cell theory. Okay, so how about we do the acellular ones over here? These are not made of cells. Which two are those? Okay, so how are we going to differentiate viruses from prions? It's very tempting to just write viruses there and prions there. But again, make the flowchart instructive for how you would identify whether it's a virus or a prion. What's the type of molecule the virus has that the prion doesn't? That's one way to do it. What is nucleic acid? Well, it's either RNA or DNA for its genome. Okay, that gives us our viruses. Okay, it's a virus, so it's acellular with the nucleic acid genome. Okay, if there's no nucleic acid, oops, reading left to right, I defined my abbreviation over there. Watch out for that. Always define your abbreviations. You got a prion. Okay, so we've already taken care of a couple of these. All right, so we've got the cellular ones. All right, six over here, and there's going to be a lot of ways you could separate these. You could do this a few times until you cover more and more of the characteristics on that table. Discussion question number one. So. Use that left column of that table for ideas for what characteristics to pick. How could you define the cellular life into two different groups? Think about how the domains of life are organized. Okay, so I'm going to write prokaryotes over here and eukaryotes over there. But uh oh, sorry, but I used a, a type of group. I didn't show here what characteristics would allow you to identify prokaryotes. All right, so let's do that. Um, I'll leave those two words there for now to help with your studies. You could have just written, well, think about it. What's one way you can identify whether it's a eukaryote? What's a big organelle you could look for? Okay, how about has nucleus? Remember, if it's multicellular, it's got more than one nucleus, one in each cell at least. 
nuclei. Okay? Prokaryotes, no nucleus. You could talk about the genome organization. That's, a, that's pretty neat if you think about it, that when you go to the eukaryotes, they've evolved a different kind of chromosome. All these use DNA or RNA or both. All cellular life on Earth uses DNA for its genome. But how that molecule looks is different. This is a circular chromosome and just one of them. Eukaryotes have multiple chromosomes or multiple double helical DNAs to organize their genes. And they're linear, so not a loop. Um, so you could go there with it. Um, that actually implies the way the cells divide. So these have to use mitosis because they need to keep those multiple chromosomes well organized so that when they divide, one nucleus gets a full set of chromosomes and the other nucleus also gets a full set of chromosomes. Um, these don't use mitosis, do they? So what do they use? This is on your table, isn't it? Yeah. They use binary fission, don't they? So you think archaea and bacteria both use binary fission? They do. So with binary fission, they just got one chromosome to worry about, so they just copy it right at the start of their cell division process and stick a membrane and a wall in between. Okay, so I'm to be clean here, I'm just going to leave one characteristic here. Nucleus or no nucleus. Okay, so if it doesn't have a nucleus, I'm going to put both of my prokaryotes over here. Now you need a way to distinguish the bacteria from the archaea. Uh, you could go with, look at your table again. How about cell wall composition? So it's made of peptidoglycan. That gives you uh, your bacteria domain. It's so all the bacteria. All right, so we already got one done now on this side. All right, when you go further, number 12, you're going to need a, another pair of characteristics because you've got on that list in question number 12, you've got two different bacteria on there. So you could think about what you saw in the microscopy images that could help you, for instance. Um, all right, enough said for there. Ask me if you want some more help with that, of course. All right, so how about uh, pseudopeptidoglycan is what the archaea have. Okay. This is where I'm going to regret using a small chalkboard, right? <laughs> okay, so what's left for the ones that have a nuclei? We're going to have to distinguish between these four, aren't we? All right, lots of ways to do that. It's tempting to go unicellular versus multicellular next, but then look back at your list and see if that is the easiest way to treat this. Look at fungi. Are they all multicellular? What did you look in the lab that at the in the lab images that were unicellular? So yeast are type of fungi, they're unicellular. Um, just like mushrooms, they are non-motile. They have cell walls that are made of chitin. You'll come back to this in your book. You'll have to note it all now. They are non-motile. So it's almost like they are and it's almost like they're animals in that they need to consume food. Um, they're heterotrophs is the technical term for that. You know, they're not making their own sugar. They're getting their carbon through consuming organic matter. They're heterotrophs. Uh, but they just sit there. They don't walk around to get their food like we do. So those are the decomposers. Um, but they're, they're a mix of unicellular and multicellular. So why don't we go with one of those other types of uh, uh, characteristics to separate from the others? Or you could do cell wall versus no cell wall. Another option. Let's do that. Since we have cell wall going on this level over here anyway, so that might look kind of neat. My flow chart's going to get kind of a funny shape here. OK, has cell wall. Notice I didn't distinguish what it's made out of, because I've got a couple different kinds here. Okay, 
Um, now we can distinguish the fungi from the algae. You can say what the cell wall is made out of. Uh, you can say it's uh, metabolism, so heterotroph. We could observe that in the laboratory. We're going to talk about one way you could get at whether it is autotrophic or not. So a type of autotrophic metabolism is what all the plant kingdom does, and plus the unicellular algae too. I am simplifying this a bit because there is a photosynthetic bacteria that you're going to look at in the lab. Um, and you can make a huge broad algae definition to include that, but let's just keep it simple here and define the algae as our um, eukaryotes and you've got your unicellular eukaryotic algae and your multicellular algae in the plant kingdom. Okay, so uh, has a cell wall autotrophic. So what's that kind of metabolism that the algae do and all the plants do? Photosynthesis. So you could observe what it does photosynthesis. You can make this photosynthetic versus non-photosynthetic if you want, and that would cover both of those, wouldn't it? You could say has chlorophyll or has chloroplasts, doesn't have chloroplasts. All right, fungi. If you want for your studies, you can note more characteristics from that table down here. I mentioned a couple of them. Cell wall made of chitin, non-motile, other stuff. All right, some algae are motile, actually. Okay, um, so under the algae, could put what the cell wall is made of, could say more about the metabolism, could say that some are unicellular, some are multicellular. That's true of the fungi also. Okay, we still rolling? Good, we're almost done. Okay, I hope this isn't getting too boring and I hope that you can read all this stuff. Of course, my office hours are a much better kind of live way to do this, so I hope this video is not going to keep any of you from coming in that would have come in for help on this. Um, check the drop-in schedule, hit me with an email if none of those times work for you in a given week. Um, but, you know, this one's almost done. Let's finish it up. Okay, so what's left? Protozoans and helminths. All right, so protozoans are animal-like, but helminths are actually in the animal kingdom. So if you look at the parasitic worm, it can kind of throw me a little bit when I first see those in the microbiology class, because we've got examples that are huge to the naked eye, but they can be very small, and they cause infectious diseases, and it's a very medically focused microbiology class. But if you're trying to figure out if they move, think about your definition for the, all, the whole animal kingdom, including those worms. Animals are motile, period. Um, uh, at least some point in each animal's uh, lifetime. Uh, they're also heterotrophic. They don't have a cell wall that makes it easier to walk. They're all multicellular. These protozoans are all unicellular. So for this branch, you could just go, for example, unicellular versus multicellular. Look back at your images from this lab. Do you think that protozoans are motile? Can they actively move? They can. So does helmets have uh, muscles? These protozoans have either a flagella or a cilia or cilia or pseudopods. Um, this is in your uh, lab itself. Um, but you can note it now if that helps you. All right, so let's not use motility because both branches are going to be motile. But we can say as a universal, as a def definite part of the definition of protozoans is that they are all unicellular. They're both unicellular and they are eukaryotic. Okay, and then if you're looking at a cellular eukaryote, um, but, oops, I forgot the other uh, pair of that branch one. No cell wall. No cell wall. Man, if I was watching this video, I'd be like, oh, if I was in a meeting with him, I've got to tell him he forgot to write no cell wall there. I kind of like, I'll make an excuse for myself. It's okay to make some 
Uh, mistake. I like making those kind of mistakes because if you caught that, you learned it, right? It's like, oh, I want to teach somebody how to draw a float chart now because this person's not doing it right. <laughs> okay, so no cell wall, unicellular, eukaryote, it's a protozoan. Okay, cellular, it's eukaryotic, there's no cell wall. How about the multicellular ones? Okay, now out of this list, remember we're just using this list. We're not making this flowchart about all the whole of the animal kingdom. We're just making it off of this type, this list, which is our groups or basic groups. So the broadest group, uh, list of groups, and each group is very, very broad to try to cover everything. Basic groups of microbes. Okay, so we're worried about the helmets out of the animal kingdom. Out of the animal kingdom. Okay. All right. Okay. There's your videotape, uh, mini lecture. Uh, nice and awkward, I hope. Uh, so hit me up on Zoom or in person for more help.